Okay, we're back. We're live with Midnight in Brussels, although it's only 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. And we have uh, Gary Kondakar joining us. She's with Global Relations Forum, which is a think tank in Brussels. Welcome back again to the show, Gary. So nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure. So you just came back from Paris. You had a, uh, a think tank uh, conference there. You were involved. Yes. Can you tell us about the conference? And can you tell us about Paris? Yes, well, it was a short trip and it was um, basically about climate change and energy issues. Um, so the topic uh, that we're looking at is how, uh, well, first of all, climate change is still extremely important in Europe. It's a huge priority, uh, definitely not uh, under Trump. Uh, administration, but um, it's still big here. And this is what we're discussing is how to deal with uh, climate change now that America might pull out. So if the U.S. pulls out, especially the Paris Agreement, how do we deal with it? So this is this was the topic, and uh, this is why I traveled there, and there were lots of experts from across Europe around to discuss this issue and a number of others, which also includes the multiplicity of actors. So while you have, for instance, the U.S. that's pulling out, you also have a lot of um, companies that are um, actively contributing uh, towards climate action. Uh. You have various uh, U.S. cities, for instance, uh. Uh, and they are participating. And there's another factor that's important to consider is what is now called post-truth is the denial of facts, is, you know, alternative uh, facts, if you like, <laughs> and uh, fake stories, fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> but, but yeah, so that was the, it was, it was sobering, but also um, quite interesting. And uh, the, the good part is that, you know, uh, experts here are thinking of going forward, basically uh, looking forward and, it's also sad in a certain way that, you know, Europeans have also always seen the U.S. as, a, as an ally, as a like-minded partner, now considering how we can move forward without the U.S. So it's, um, it was quite an impactful yeah. meeting. Well, let me, let me go to the bottom of line of that. You said that one of the big questions is what to do about climate change um, uh, if and when the U.S. pulls out. What what was the decision on that? What do you? What's the strategy? Well, um, that's what we're all looking at at the moment. So you had the who's who of climate and energy experts around that table, basically, um, and the biggest strategy to be decided is that exactly. So maybe the EU will have the European Union will um, add funding to the UN's climate fund. Um, where the U.S. should be contributing quite a bit as a global um, historic emitter. Um, so because of U.S. industrialization, it is it has contributed to this climate change more than the developing countries. So it has to contribute to the developing countries. Um, U.S. is also one of the world's largest emitters. Uh, but despite that, you know, it's actually there's also a realization that you can't walk back on climate action, which means that you can't make a U-turn to uh, fossil fuels because renewables are cheaper um, and they're f the fastest growing source of energy. So, the enormous market forces at play. Yeah. You just can't go back. It would be tragic on many levels if we walk back on that. But, you know, one of the, um, you know, Donald Trump has also been dishing uh, the, uh, the UN. NATO, the EU, all of those things, the distancing himself and um, giving concern about uh, American participation in them and support of them. And one of the, one of the pieces that he, he continues to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, repeat is that the U.S. is paying more than its fair share and uh, European EU countries are paying less than their fair share. I mean, is there a response to that? Are European countries considering increasing their share in these things so as to deal with his claim in that regard? Um, <clears throat> so uh, this has been an issue for many, many years that European most European countries don't contribute the 2% of the GDP that they're supposed to to the NATO budget. Uh, 
the Europeans are one of the top contributors to the UN, like the US, of course. But um, to NATO, it's different. Now, um, I believe that most Europeans don't do that because the fact that the US is in this alliance is the biggest deterrence. And they don't need to scale up because they know they can rely upon the U.S. and nobody's going to challenge U.S. superiority uh, in security matters. So that is the reason why they didn't so far put much more uh, money into defense. But um, so I read this very interesting article recently. I forgot where it was because, you know, there's so many, so many articles coming out at the moment. And it was about how Trump is not stupid as many people might think but um all what he's doing right now the threats the tantrums it was all a test balloon you know how they send up weather balloons to check and this is what he was doing and this is how he's testing the environment and it's same in his book as uh, the art of the deal it's <laughs> just about coming from a position of arrogance, threatening to break the deal, and then making concessions. So this is apparently his way of trying to get deals, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's, um, it unfortunately doesn't work that way. No. In diplomacy. Yeah. Uh, so that's, it's, it goes against diplomacy, the very essence of it, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that takes me to uh, the whole thing about NATO. So he's, uh, you know, talking about pulling support for NATO, uh, considering NATO irrelevant. And at the same time, uh, Vladimir Putin <laughs> is still active in Ukraine, is still pushing on uh, Western Europe border, so to speak. Um, and he's making, he's making trips uh, into the soft underbelly to try to enhance his influence there. Um, is, is Putin taking advantage of the, um, the confusion that Trump has created? You know, to be honest, and extremely honest, um, I think Putin might be confused himself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, because just imagine if it's not Russia that did it, but some other country. You, you never know. Maybe some other countries' operatives, you know, were operating from Russia, hacking it, and, you know, and they created this, and Putin, of course, as usual, got the blame. Maybe he's as careful about Trump as, you know, it's not uh, surprising, I would say, because European countries are not going to relax their sanctions. Yeah. Is Trump is not someone who's reliable. And if he's not best friends with Putin, and he himself says he's never been, you know, he's never met Putin before, you never know. <laughs> so, but um, Putin is continuing Russia's strong stance on its geopolitical supremacy. Uh -huh. uh, it does not want NATO expansion uh, to um, towards its borders. So now you have a few um, buffer states: so Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova. Um, and what Trump is saying, so Trump's rhetoric fits in well with what Putin wants, which means that, you know, he's not going to, uh, Trump says that he's not going to expand NATO, he's not going to put into the budget. That means that uh, expansion of NATO stops at Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine wants membership of NATO, and this is basically why um, the whole... Uh, um, annexation of Crimea and Russia's uh, entry into Ukraine happened, you know, it was a huge um, conflict over Ukraine's intentions to join NATO and get closer to the EU. Um, but tensions have been brewing up uh, on the border with Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia. But I don't think Putin will make any sudden moves. <laughs> Uh -huh. It would be silly to underestimate the situation. Yeah, it's a different dance now, isn't it? Because of that unreliability, you know, we have uh, we have Trump getting into arguments with bloody everyone. I mean, <laughs> everyone he talks to, it comes, it turns out to be an argument. I don't know if you get Saturday Night Live in Europe, but there's a program oh. here that parodies him every Saturday night, and it's very good. <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> He's the object of tremendous ridicule. For that unreliability. 
So I guess my question is, um, you know, how do people feel? How do the how do the people in the think tanks feel? How do the leaders feel? Um, how, do the, how does the public feel about Trump? Well, for me, the most epic moment of last week, uh, apart from, of course, uh, Melissa McCarthy playing Sean Spicer on his set. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you guess, I guess you do see Saturday Night Live, of eh? Of course, they do. <laughs> Alec Baldwin, of course. Um, <laughs> but it was really, really funny to see um, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, explaining what... Um, uh, the Geneva Convention is to President Trump. Uh, and one of my friends basically tweeted that um, maybe Trump thinks it's sort of a business convention, a business gathering, you know? <laughs> and it's just, just following the Muslim ban, and everybody is in utter shock, you know? Um, nobody knows what is going to happen because when uh, the news broke out that Donald Trump may have yelled, at uh, Australian Prime Minister Turnbull, um, everybody's been on edge, you know. Uh, <laughs> the UK, okay, they have a special relationship, but the UK has been massively criticized in Europe. Um, Theresa May, so the UK Prime Minister, has also been called spineless because she held hands with Trump. Uh, and this is across Europe, so UK does not have a good reputation at the moment just because they're close to Trump. Um, the, uh, Trump was going to visit, uh, when, when he visits the UK, he was going to speak at the, um, in, in the parliament, but I just, and this is breaking news basically that, um, he will no longer speak in parliament because the, uh, speaker of the house refused, uh, to allow him to speak, uh, and, and really, uh, God save the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have my answer. <laughs> well, I mean, but you know, one of the uh, benefits of Trump, uh, the unlikely benefits, you know, you always have to look on the bright side, is that it's going to push Europe closer together and make it a much stronger union because they know. And honestly, who would have ever, ever imagined that... Um, <laughs> You would have the U.S., which has always been an ally to Europe for the past what, 75 years at least. Yes. Um, 100 years, you know. Yes. yes. Would become a major threat. Nobody imagined that. Yeah. Nobody would have even prepared for that. So. <laughs> well, you know, the flip side of that, though, uh, just you know, uh, one one observation is that as Europe becomes stronger because of Trump. As Trump becomes a, more of a joke to Europe and other places, um, the U.S. loses credibility. The U.S. loses its uh, influence, doesn't it? Yes, of course. Now, um, you also see a bit of the dichotomy between the administration to a certain extent. So you also had the military chief of the U.S. who was visiting Japan, and he reassured Shinzo Abe that the alliance stands no matter what. Um, which, you know, uh, makes you question whether this is just theatrics, whether um, Donald Trump uh, would change the course of U.S. history, or is it some sort of um, game, you know? Because he will attend the NATO summit uh, mm -hmm. and the G7 summit as well in Europe, in Italy. Um, so it's not clear yet. if. For, for me, at least, it's not clear. Okay, he was he has no experience in diplomacy, um, but he's not um, stupid, basically. Mm -hmm. it's uh, The U.S. is not uh, a country that would, you know, allow probably... It's It's been a superpower. It's stayed superpower. It's survived Richard Nixon. <laughs> and, um, the question yeah. is whether it will survive Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I know. By the way, uh, I wonder if you watch these videos um, that uh, almost every other European country has been creating. Uh, have you watched them? No, so I haven't. Basically, it starts as, uh, you know, Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, you know, America first. Yes. And you have various European countries, so the Netherlands, Germany, who say, okay, you know, this is a message 
an introductory message from our government about our country, you know, and it gives, it's a parody uh, video. Uh. Then it's, it's okay if Ameri we understand that America's first, but can we just say, you know, Germany second or the Netherlands <laughs> second? <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing, really. You should watch. I will send it to you. Gary, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back, and I'd like to talk to you about some of the other issues in Europe, including, uh, you know, for example, the migrants. We'll be yes. right back. My name is Mark Schlav, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Hey, has your signal just been taken over or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. We're back, we're live with Gauri Kandakar of Global Relations Forum. She joins us by Skype, uh, and we love to see her every few weeks uh, from Brussels. And if you're wondering, it's 11, 11.15 in Brussels right now, p.m., heading on to midnight, so she does us the, the honor of staying up late for us. Thank you, Gauri. <laughs> yes, my pleasure and honor completely. <laughs> well, so tell us about, uh, you know, the, 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 the winds of, the winds of, um, of hatred, if you will, in, in Europe, because we have that here in this country, and I, I wonder how things are doing in terms of uh, the rise of the right uh, in Europe and the rise of, um, you know, what do you call it, people not getting along with each other. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's a bit awkward to say this, but I think, and it's the feeling across Europe at the moment that by seeing the example of Trump, I think things have quieted down here because nobody wants to elect a Trump here, you know? Ah. It's, it's actually an example. We know what's happened now. So you do have, um, so today in Europe, anyone who associates with him, and you know, most European countries are completely socialist, social democrats, you know, in their ethos. So, People who interact with Trump, like Nigel Farage, like um, Geert Wilders from the Netherlands, uh, even Theresa May, you know, she's a conservative leader, but they're being criticized back in Europe. And no longer do people want hate. They're seeing what hate has done to the world's superpower and their biggest ally. So now they are really fearful. And, and most people are wanting to preserve stability. Oh, that's so, so interesting, because he's yes. only been in office for two weeks. <laughs> yes, I, I precisely. Well, he's done more than any other president, I think, in terms of dividing people and shocking people and uh, unprecedented executive orders and also, you know, his uh, tweets, especially about the judiciary, they, they're quite sobering, you know. Um, but when most people have voted, let's say, for Brexit, right? Uh -huh. uh, or even in the U.S., some have voted because of their own situation. They've not been happy. They've not seen the bigger geopolitical picture. Now in Europe that they're seeing it, they know that they can't afford instability across the Atlantic and at home. Uh, how so interesting. So there's more, to, there's more at stake when you vote for stability, when you vote the boring leader, you know, when it's a smaller country that votes to, you know, a, 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 um, how do you say, protest vote. Yeah. It's still fine with, yeah. the European, you're with the European Union, you know, you're surrounded by other countries. Um, and this is what has also been said by some members of uh, the British Parliament, but also across the public, is that 
We need to rethink Brexit because the geopolitical conditions have changed. This is no longer a tenable situation because the U UK, when it voted for Brexit, imagine that they would leave a strong union, but they would also have a strong US. So they would be the bridge, you know. Now that for Europe, most Europeans, the US is collapsing, is becoming protectionist, it's isolating itself, is building walls, uh, and 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 and. UK would leave a prosperous Europe. It's no longer tenable. The UK isolates itself then. Oh, this is so interesting. I'm really, um, I'm really interested in what you have to say on this. But you know, until a few weeks ago, you and I were following this whole move to the right in Europe, the reaction to the migrants, the you know the yeah. reaction against those leaders who wanted to allow refugees to come into their countries yeah. it was moving right are, are you saying that maybe uh, this is being you know modified in some way that this has changed because of trump yes in a little to a little extent to a certain extent you don't see as many protests okay so you did have um, the hungarian uh, leader victor orban uh, who came out in support of the muslim ban you know of course well it is a muslim ban sorry but he did come out in support but he's one of the f leaders you know there are 28 still 28 member countries of the european union um and this is just a a, a move for the the you know the masses basically mm. that might seem to be um because you have to understand that these countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they've not seen as much migration, as much um, demographic change for many, many years, for many centuries even, you know? It's mm. always been white. Uh, and it's always been European and Christian. Yeah. So it's an influx. At the moment, it's an influx. Not as big, I would say, but it's still an influx. So people do this. However, uh, it's winter time. So migration flows are reduced. Yeah. They're larger in the summers. Yeah. Um, and people are just shocked at what's going on in the US and they they don't want to be that, like that. There have been so many protests here in Brussels but across Europe as well against Trump, against the Muslim ban. There have been the women's marches here as well. And um, yeah, it's a rejection of what they're seeing now. Ah. And they don't want to become that. Well, you know, we've had some really strange reactions, I mean, unpredictable, I think, reactions to, uh, to Trump's um, building walls. I mean, a lot of people react uh, to oppose that, obviously, the, the marches and so. Um, and uh, a lot of Jewish people, for example, have come out in favor of the Muslims, which is uh, that hasn't happened in that scale before. Um, and people are rallying toward the notion of um, of love, if you will, of accepting uh, people from outside, of becoming diverse or appreciating diversity uh, against Trump. So it's a reaction to Trump, but it is truly happening, at least in some quarters in this country. At the same time, there's the right wing, you know, Nazi view of things, and that's happening too with anti-Semitism and anti-Muslimism. Um, it, it seems to be in, you know, in in transition right now and you don't know which way it's going to go and all everyone is speaking on it. and i i imagine the same thing is happening in europe you get both sides of it you get love and you get hate and, you get, and you're not sure which way it's going to go <laughs> yes but now you see hate is a very very tiny it has become a very tiny part of it people um really uh, it's many people don't realize that at, at least in the u.s is how important the U.S. is to Europe, how big a country it is in front of Europe. So it's a huge, major example. And what's happening in the U.S., to the U.S., actually, it's utterly shocking here. Mm. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's, it's frightening, basically, because uh, European foreign policy normally always follows U U.S. foreign policy. Um, the Europeans look for security to the U.S. still, uh, even though they were, they have some of the largest militaries in the world, yes, uh, and the highest technologies. But they still look to the U.S. quite a bit. 
um actually we there's also um so you did uh, you know you're right about uh, different communities coming together uh, as a rejection of hate because you never know which community gets targeted next so yeah. you know during the world war uh, you had the jewish community that was targeted now it's islam but it's also a mix yes i mean you have the nazi symbols uh in in, in new york metro which is shocking yes so it's uh, but um there are a lot of millennials i believe and there've been some articles as well on it who completely reject hate who completely reject divisiveness um and this is because they've been some of the most open generations yeah they've traveled more mm-hmm. they have large number of technologies at hand they're more connected with the world they have more knowledge uh they just up to date and so millennials have a more open attitude in well, that sense that leads me to um you know the the question i want to put to you about <coughs> putting this in global perspective yes this is a hard one but you've been following you're a geopolitical person a think tank person a global relations person where is it going what are we i know it's very hard to predict and it's an unfair question but where is it going over the next uh, say 2 3 years what are we going to have here in terms of global politics yes in terms of uh, global um, divisiveness or global togetherness ah uh, wow <laughs> it's it's a hard question i it's yeah it's truly hard but what i believe is that um the trump election is a significant moment in history not because it will change the way the us works but it's going to bring about a more balanced approach to international relations a more um it's it's ha- it has sped up the process of um multipolarity you know so you have a multipolar system with different sources of governance um and it's just sped that up so you you're going to have a the the uh, the realization that other countries are as much important as well it's my feeling i i think it's going to lead to more you know um unity abroad because there's so many people who are coming out in favor of the un so you've had okay the us wants to back out from climate change but india and china are now leading in renewable energy which is incredible you know to uh, a decade before they were being criticized as the worst polluters now they're leaders of clean energy so it's i think it's going to speed up multipolarity uh, fascinating and i totally agree with you and i really appreciate that answer <laughs> but one one of the the flip side of that again is that at the end of the day um we have a a reordering of the world order i think uh that that's what we're talking about and at the end of the day the US will not be nearly as prominent as it has been uh, because of this reordering don't you agree i agree completely you're right but based in hawaii and you know you have paycom uh they what what do you use how do you see the the changes I <clears throat> I'm only reminded of the of the the argument between Trump and Donald Schwarzenegger <clears throat> where Schwarzenegger <laughs> proposed that they change places and uh, <clears throat> and he suggested that uh, he would be president even though he wasn't born in the US that's a constitutional problem uh, and that Trump uh, could be can go back to his apprentice uh, television show <clears throat> and that would be a benefit for everybody concerned because and here's the point Schwarzenegger said because then we could all sleep at night. <laughs> and that's my answer to your question. Nobody's sleeping at night very well, nobody I know, and we're all waiting for some resolution. I am reminded of the the counters that they always had on television before the debates. They would say it's so many hours before the debate begins and you'd see this counter going down down to, you know, ground zero when the debate started. Well, I think soon enough there's going to be counters about how many days and hours it will be before the Trump administration is over. Yes, you know. There was this really funny tweet that I read um some uh Democrat uh senator and she 
replied to Donald Trump's tweet when he said, how can you, what is the procedure for impeaching a U.S. president on grounds of incompetence? And she retweeted that tweet and said, you know, maybe Donald Trump has spent his life to answer that question. <laughs>